Let's turn our Bibles to Romans 12. We continue with our, um, our study here, Romans 12. We want to read Romans 12. And also, I want to read a few verses to begin with of 1 Corinthians. Okay? 1 Corinthians 12, 4 through 7. Let's turn there first. I'm sorry. Turn 1 Corinthians 12, 4 through 7, then we're back to our study of Romans 12. And I'll tell you that in just a moment again. First letter of Corinthians, Brother Paul, he's dealing here with in 12, 13, 14, he's dealing with the gifts of the Spirit in the church, and they had a time in Corinth. It'll help us to catch this, and this is Brother Paul's emphasizing to the Romans, too, when we get back there. 1 Corinthians 12 and 4. Now, there are diversities of gifts. That's different kinds, but the same Spirit, one Spirit, Holy Spirit, there are differences of administrations, but the same Lord. There are diversities of operations, different workings. But it is the same God which worketh all in all. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with all. That means to help all the church. For to one is given by the Spirit the word of wisdom, to another word of knowledge by the same Spirit. And we go in there to the... Again, the gifts of the Spirit. Now, flip back to our major text, Romans 12. And I'll pick up where we left off last week. We'll read verse 5 through 8. Romans 12, 5 through 8. So we being many are how many bodies? One. One body in Christ and everyone members of one another. We're supposed to help one another. We're together in this. He's talking about the church, you see, just like your body. Just for example tonight, if you hit my finger with a hammer, well, I say, well, I declare that little finger, it just had to be hurt itself. No, it's going to hurt from the top of your head down to the soles of your feet. Now, isn't that true? So that means every part, head to toe, is going to hurt. Why? There's only one little part hurting. But it affects. The effect goes over the whole body. You see? In the same way in the church. We're supposed to care for one another. Six. Now, here's the gifts. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us. Where the prophecy let us prophesy according to the proportion of faith. Or ministry, let us wait on our ministering. Or if he that teacheth on teaching. Or he that exhorteth on exhortation. He that giveth, let him do it with simplicity. He that ruleth with diligence. He that showeth mercy with cheerfulness. Now, let's take them apart. Verse 6. We have gifts that are different according to the grace that's given to us. Gifts differ. God gives the gifts through his Holy Spirit. It's the same. You remember back in 1 Corinthians, Brother Paul said, you're bothering about gifts of the Spirit, which you should be centered on the gift of the Holy Spirit himself. He's the one that comes into your life when Jesus left, he said, I'm sending the Holy Spirit to be your teacher and guide, guide you in all the truth, guide you to who I am as Savior Lord, guide you to do what the body, the church is supposed to do. So God has used his Holy Spirit to give us the gifts so the local body can grow up in a balanced way. You wouldn't want to have five preachers up here. We should get... Dwayne, Matt, 
Chad, Donald, and Bob up here. And everybody's called the pastor of Skyline Heights. Now, how is that going to work? It'd be great if all five were pastors, but they can't be but one real pastor of the church. They can be different assistant kinds of pastors. You see what I'm saying? But you can't have everybody doing the same thing. Who's going to be a teacher in the Sunday school? Who's going to be an evangelist, for example, reaching the people? He uses all the gifts so that a church can work in a balanced way. Each Christian must exercise his gift by faith. You may not see the result of your ministry, but the Lord sees it and blesses it. We can't do it by our own effort. You can't have enough willpower and say, well, I've got to drum up enough faith. I've got to drum up this gift. You don't have to drum up anything. God gives it. That's called grace. He's poured out favor. He's undeserved favor upon you. Well, I'm going to be a better preacher and teacher just by positive thinking. Yeah, that's what's wrong with a lot of preachers, I guess. They're going to say, well, I think good about this week. I think I'll preach about Jesus next Sunday. They have no idea what they're preaching about Jesus. Just because I'm thinking about Jesus doesn't mean that's going to be what I need to preach about. Pastor's brother was obsessed with a group. Maybe I'll use this illustration. Last time became obsessed with a group, and that group was talking about, whatever you do, just think of a good, positive thing, and it's going to happen. I think I said that last time. No, that's not the way the Spirit of God works. God gives gifts through His Holy Spirit, the grace of God. He gives us faith and power to do what He wills. Our role is to be faithful, seek ways to serve others with what Christ has given to us. Now, look at the different gifts. You ready? Now, we ought to use our gifts to help the whole body. Don't miss that. That was back in 1 Corinthians 12. If you have any questions about it, go back and read that chapter. 1 Corinthians 12. Okay? First, it says prophecy. Let us prophesy according to the proportion of faith. Now, It doesn't always mean foretelling the future. Now, there's some great, what we call prophetic teachers that look ahead, searching the scriptures, trying to find and understand uh, the word of God in the future. We know that we study a prophecy of Daniel, for example. And then you got the Revelation and other places in scripture. Ezekiel, Isaiah talks about prophecy in the future. But anyway... Another meaning of being, having the gift of prophecy is to foretell, to preach the gospel with boldness according to the proportion of your faith that he gives. You have the gift of prophecy? Then it says the gift of ministry. See that in verse 7? Now, our ministry, let us wait on our ministry. It's talking about your service. Minister is a servant. And it's not just talking about preaching ministry. What about the teaching ministry? What about the budget or financial ministry? What about music ministry? Do you see what I'm saying? Do you have the gift of service? Do it faithfully, lovingly for the glory of God and his church. So when you see that gift of ministry, that just does not mean the gift of being a pastor. That's a different role. Okay, and are we doing ministry, service to our Lord? A next thing, gift, is a gift of what? Teaching. He that teacheth on teaching. The ability to impart knowledge and information that is to instruct the mind. 
in the basics of understanding the truth of Scripture. Now, if you have your Bible, you turn with me to 2 Tim, 2 Timothy, 1 and 2 Thessalonians, 1 and 2 Timothy. Now, Brother Paul is on his last days, I'm sure, in this thing. He is there in Rome with Emperor Nero. They've arrested him again. Isn't that interesting how this great servant, minister for Jesus, wherever they put him, he was riding. Isn't that something? He's riding. Riding the Word of God. Riding through the Spirit of God. Riding to the churches. Encouraging the churches. Helping the churches. Waking the churches up. Imparting understanding of the Scripture. Now look what he says here in 2 Tim chapter 2. 14. Of these things put them in remembrance, charging them before the Lord. He's talking about the preachers and teachers of the word. They strive not about with words to no profit, but to the subverting of the hearers. Study to show thyself approved to God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth, but shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase unto more ungodliness. You got to stay with it, friends. Study. Study it. That's what's wrong. If you preach or teach in the Word of God, you've got to stay at it. That's what he's trying to teach Timothy as a younger man. Donald J. Barnhouse, he's a great preacher of years ago, a commentator, a student of the Word of God. He said, teaching is somewhat like, somewhat like swimming. You must commit yourself to the water to learn how to swim. What does that mean? You've got to get in it. So I said, well, I'm a great swimmer. I said, when's the last time you swam? Well, I ain't been in the water in 50 years. Now he's only, he's 60 years old now. Last time you got in water is 10 years old, and you're a great swimmer. Well, maybe he is. I don't know. But he's not in the water. You learn to swim by swimming. You learn to teach by teaching. Try as soon as possible to communicate a truth you've learned. You receive a blessing from the Word of God as you pass it on. For example, when you learn something from a sermon, all right, church, are you listening? Did you, listen, did you write anything down this morning? You're going to go back to the, uh, the app or the website or whatever? When you learn something from the sermon, tell someone at the earliest opportunity. You apply the teaching of the Bible to your own heart first, then God can make it come alive and apply it to a listener. Isn't that good? You've done that. I know some of you have done that. Everybody ought to be doing this Christian you don't have to be a preacher or teacher. You just listen to something that's powerful. Say, look here. Type that on the um, email or text or whatever. And send it to somebody. All right. Verse 8. The gift of exhortation. He that exhorteth on exhortation. Now, the better word here in English is encourage. Encourage you. Look at the word, encourage. Pour in somebody's life courage. Isn't that good? That's, that's what encouragement is. Preachers, teachers, parents, college students, young children, older children, youth. Seniors and way up seniors, 90 years old. Isn't that something? Motivate somebody. Help 
Stir them up. Hey, let's look, go back to Acts. We're there this morning, you know. But we go way back to Acts chapter 9. This is where really Paul was on that road to Damascus, you know. But the day I was just seeing about on that road to Damascus was he was just speaking to that king at the very end of that uh, journey on to Rome there. So he's just going back over there. Now watch this. This is after he was converted. God showed up in the great powerful way and called him to be a chosen vessel to take the gospel of the Gentiles, kings, children of Israel. He was going to suffer and all that. Ananias came in verse 17, put his hands on him. You know, he's blind. Say, receive your sight, my brother Paul. And God filled him with the Holy Spirit. Anyway, he began to preach right there in Damascus where he was going to take the Christians out and take them to the jailhouse or, or drag them or whatever he did to them. And uh, sometimes they were killed for the faith in Jesus. But anyway, he had wakened, got a new heart, new life, got a new master, the Lord Jesus. But look who came along. They're going to kill old Saul. That's, that's the religious crowd. And the other's going to kill him. 25 and following. Are you ready? Acts 9, 25. Now watch these powerful words. It's a beautiful picture. You've got you to get, get a picture on this. <clears throat> You'll get a real picture. Then the disciples took him by night and led him down by the wall in a basket. How would you like to be led down by the wall in a basket? That kind of scary to think about, isn't it? What's going to happen to the ropes? How big is the basket? I guess Paul said, well, if the boys are going to do it for me, they're going to help me. They'll love me. They'll drop me down one way or another. They'll get it done. So he's going down the wall now in the basket. 26, and when Saul was come to Jerusalem, now he slipped away. Got out of Damascus, came down from Syria. That's, you know, Damascus, Syria, if you think about that today, coming down into Israel. He come to Jerusalem. He essayed to join himself. That's what he wanted to do. Join himself to the disciples. But they were all afraid of him. Well, sure. Wouldn't you be afraid? This guy, he'd been killing people, standing before Stephen, watched him stone to death, took his clothing. They were all afraid. They didn't believe that he was a disciple. 27. Watch these words. But Barnabas took him. See that? That's an encourager. He says, I, I trust him. I believe God's changed him. I've heard him. I've walked with him. I want you to know that he's a man of God. He's on the right side. He's on Jesus' side now. We've always known he, he loved God in, in, the, in the Old Testament law, the Word of God. But now, he's with Jesus. He brought him to the apostles. Declared unto them how he had seen the Lord in the way, and that he had spoken to him, and how he had preached boldly. There he goes, preaching boldly at Damascus in whose name? The name of Jesus, right there. That's a beautiful thing. And he was with them coming in and going out at Jerusalem. And he spake boldly, 29, in the name of the Lord Jesus, and disputed against the Grecians, that the Greeks, but they went about to slay him. Barnabas. You know what his name means? Son of Consolation. That's old King James. Consolation means encouragement, comfort, courageous. And old Barney was one of the Christian disciples, early followers of Jesus, who came along with side brother Paul, said, I urged him on. I poured strength into him. I gave him the courage. I would walk with him. He was a weak Christian. But he became the greatest missionary God ever used. Isn't that a beautiful picture? Who are you exhorting, encouraging, pouring in courage, coming alongside, helping to be a true follower of Jesus? You think about it. You take your paper right there, your Bible, if you want to put it on your side of your Bible, write down the name of a person or a couple or a family who you, that you want to see follow Jesus with a whole heart, 
or they're backslidden and come back to Jesus. If they're unchurched, they may be said one time they trusted Jesus, they don't have a church home, they don't live for Jesus. Who is it? God wants you to go to them. Say, look, you need encouragement, and I want to help you. Can you do it? All right. Verse 8, what's another gift? We're back here to, to Romans 12 now. Don't lose your place. Romans 12. He that giveth, let him do it with simplicity. Some translation can say giving with liberality. It has nothing to do with being a liberal. <laughs> All right? It's a, it's a liberal heart of giving. Simply giving to the Lord's work. You see, that's what it means. Contributing to the needs of others. You're a generous person. You're a generous person. Now, some people in this gift of giving, I mean, they, they can just walk back here and pull out a $20 bill and give it to somebody. Some of them might pull out a $100 bill. Never forget that. Man, he's a, he owned a little car bill. He's a, like a, what do you call it, used car place, a small little place there in Bristol, Tennessee. But he thought it was his calling as a businessman to help young men, like young adult men, come along if they want to be a part of the church, or like preach sometimes, teach, and maybe go into school. He could do things like that. That was in his heart. See, God made, gave him a liberal, generous heart to say, I want to give to somebody going in ministry. And I mean, he's going to give it to girls going into some other kind of ministry, too. I don't know that. He just used the example of a young fellow. Young fellow preached one Sunday. He says, Sir, I, I want to, to tell you, young man, I appreciate your heart for God. He reached in his pocket and gave him $100. Because the boy said something about it. He wanted to go on to school. He would be like to go to study at a Bible school for a period of time or something like that. But see, God just put it on his heart right then. I'm sure he didn't go, out, he didn't go there that day. He said, Well, I'm going to give the boy $100. It's just like the Spirit of God says... You do it now. This is the time to do it. So he did it. He can do it. He had the, he had the ability, you see. And that's a kind of a gift he had in his heart to do that. So God will give you something to give, and then you give it in a desire, in a loving desire to do that. Now, think of 2 Corinthians 8, 1 through 5. Don't you look at this. Now, these were the churches in Macedonia. Now, Macedonia will be what we call today northern Greece. In that region, it's called what is called the Macedonian region uh, back in, in the biblical days. So the second letter, Paul's second letter to the Corinthians, chapter 8, <clears throat> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh. Moreover, brethren, we do you to the wit of the grace of God bestowed on the churches where? Of Macedonia. So I like that northern Greece region. How that in a great trial of affliction, they're struggling, hurting these people, Christians, the abundance of their joy and deep poverty. Friends, they were down at the bottom. This is the Christian church people down at the bottom. What does it say? It abounded. It increased into the riches of their liberality, their generosity of giving. For to their power I bear record, yea, beyond their power, they were willing of themselves, praying with us, us with much entreaty, that we would receive the gift, take upon us the fellowship of the ministering to the saints, that is the struggling Christians, besides themselves, others in other places. Five. This they did not as we hope, but watch it. You want to underline something? First gave their own selves to the Lord. If you're not a Christian tonight, you don't have a heart to give. You can't have the gift of giving. And there are many Christians who don't have what we call the gift of giving because they give sometimes and some little things here and there. But this uh, gift of giving is an overabundance of joy and liberality are pouring their heart out to give of their possessions. But first of all, they give themselves. 
to the Lord and to us by the will of God. Isn't that great? We all can have some kind of gift of giving as a Christian. We ought to, but some don't. Doesn't mean they don't love Jesus or follow him. They just don't have a heart to give. Some don't have it to give. Hear about the man had very little. He said, preacher, I can't tithe. I can't, I can't, no way I can give 10% of my, of my income. I, I just can't do it. Pastor said, all right. He said, come on down here and let's pray. So they got down on their knees. Pastor began to pray. That God would increase his salary. Give him even a new job. Guess what happened? Got a new job. He started getting a bigger paycheck. $500. After a few weeks. He gave $50. Then sometime later, $1,000. That was his salary. So how much did he give? Gave 100. Then he went to 2,000. He gave 200. Then he came to the preacher and said, Preacher, I'm giving too much. The preacher said, All right, let's get on our knees today and we'll pray that God will take away that job from you and he'll drop your salary. You know what happened, don't you? I guess he got out of there. And the story is not told after that. That'll change your mind, won't it? Now, just think of that. He got $2,000, and all he had to do was give to $200. He should rejoice in it. But he said, I'm giving too much. See, he did not have the gift of giving. Even though he was giving that tithe, he didn't have the gift of giving. See, his heart wasn't right. He, he was trying to withhold it. He didn't see it. I tell you what, let's stop there. Mad, 